All right. Good day. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another Live the Fuel show. So I'm excited. I'm always excited to podcast. I've talked to that before, but today I'm catching up with a gentleman that I finally got to meet in person at the recent KetoCon 2022 after we missed it for a couple of years. He, uh, he arrived all the way from Australia, Perth uh, specifically, I believe. And this gentleman is, well, he's no longer an up and comer. He's already a big player and influencer in something that I take very seriously. We might be talking about meat today. We might be talking about beef, nutrition, health, wellness, fitness, the business behind all of that, and so much more. But this gentleman runs a kick-ass podcast called The Plant Free MD. And let's just say that he knows a little bit about the carnivore life and the carnivore lifestyle. So this gentleman spoke on stage. He also handled a ton of Q&A at KetoCon. I think he rocked the mic. I was sharing stuff all over the social medias. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the man, the myth, the legend, Dr. Anthony Chafee, sir. Welcome to Live the Fuel. Hey, hey thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, and uh, just so people understand, it's 12 hours tomorrow for him. Mm. So me, it's the end of a business day. It's about 5 p.m. right now, and it's for him. <laughs> it's 5 a.m. or what? what is it? Yeah, 5 a.m. Yeah, yeah, 5 a.m. now. Okay. All right. So we're, we're getting him ready for his busy medical day ahead. Actually, let's go ahead and set the stage for people who've never heard of you before. You mm -hmm. are a professional practicing doctor, correct? Yeah, that's correct. I'm okay. I'm uh, a neurosurgical resident. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's establish that because, again, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people here, there's lots of ways to throw around doctor in the U.S. Uh, and, again, Australia. But, again, he is not just a guru about meat. And by the way, former rugby player, pro at the pro level. Uh, by the way, how far did you go in the pro sector of that world? Uh, I played in the, the Championship League in England. I played in the Super League in America, uh, Premiership in Canada as well. And then I uh, was in you know, preseason stuff with MLR, Major League Rugby in Seattle. My, my, my team in Seattle, I played with for you know, since I was a kid. Um, nice. You know, we're the, the, the Seattle Saracens, and then they – you know, branched into the Seattle Seawolves that won the first two major league rugby tournaments. So I was sort of involved in the preseason um the first two years. Uh, but I ended up, I was already committed to doing humanitarian work in Bangladesh and, and volunteering in the refugee camps there. Um, it was like the largest humanitarian crisis in the world at the time A little bit. was in Bangladesh. Yeah. yeah. And um, I don't know, you know, not everyone's heard of it, but there was a, like a mass genocide in Burma in September, 2017. And about 200,000 people were killed in like Holocaust level evil ways. Wow. And about a million people fled into Bangladesh, Southern Bangladesh from Burma uh, to escape this. And so there wasn't really enough people helping out. So I, I felt that I needed to go over and help. So I, I, uh, you know, you know, gave up on, on playing that season to go, go help out. And, um, and then the year after that, uh, I was sort of doing some preseason stuff, but then I'd already committed to coming down to Australia. So I missed out on that season too, but, uh, but no, so I, yeah, and I was, I was an all American in high school, um, you know, played, you know, senior men's league since I was a teenager and, uh, and, and travel around for the world with that, which was absolutely just an amazing experience. Yeah. I mean, obviously traveling in general, I think opens up everybody's eyes. I think it's super cool by the way that you. I don't want to say took the risk. You took the commitment and the sacrifice to give back like that because I remember all that. It was all over the news, and mm -hmm. to some some people you talked to, they didn't get enough news exposure. Right, there wasn't enough recognition. People have already forgotten about it. I, I mean, until you tossed those numbers at me, I forgot how massive those numbers were as far as loss yep. and, and impact. It did get very very big. I, you just refreshed me. I didn't realize the numbers had gotten that high. And that was pretty mm -hmm. tragic, but I mean, I'm sure that was just a life changing experience too, uh, being able to take everything you learn and give back. So, yeah, well, it was, and 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 yes, it was. It definitely was a risk. It was um, very dangerous at the time. That that was a that was a major reason why there wasn't really enough people going over there either, because I, you know, ISIS was very active in in Bangladesh at the time, and you know, they were um, there were a lot of attacks and there was a lot of bombings. There was. Um, you know, they they blew up a hotel because there was one American staying there, and so you know they killed like I think like some like eighty some people besides the American. You know they got that American boy, and um, 
and they like ma you know maimed like another 160 in that bombing and there were you know bombings of, of restaurants and cafes mm -hmm. and they would take others uh, other sort of you know, restaurants or, or businesses hostage and they would execute anyone who didn't, you know, couldn't recite the Quran in Arabic. And, um, there was, uh, there was a story of one, one guy who re recited the Quran in Arabic and, and they said, okay, you know, you can leave. And he said, well, I mean, I can't, I, mean, I can't leave my friends. Bam. Took him out. And so, you know, they, they were not playing around and, um, I was I was looking at this, and and this was all over the the U.S. Embassy website. Mm. You know, so this is this is all you know actual you know hard hard confirmed news, and and I was looking at this, and you know it, it was one of those ones you know normally in these places like the U.S. Embassy website will say something like you know hey look use extreme caution do not come unless you have to you know try to use any other means all that stuff and and you know be extremely careful if you come. This just said flat out, it is not, you know, this is, it is like, not recommended like, it to is come not here. safe here. Yeah, yeah. it's like, it is not safe here. Do not come. Your life will be in constant danger and you will likely be killed. That's what they actually said that on, on the MZ website. It's a great You welcome. will likely yeah. be killed. Yeah. And uh, yeah, come to Bangladesh, you will likely be killed. Oh, and, my uh, gosh. and so, you know, obviously I was like, I was like, well, I don't want to just like walk into a death trap, but. You know, so I emailed the the U.S. Embassy there, and I was just like, "Hey, look, I'm a doctor. I want to go down to the refugee camps. Is it like this? You know, all over. You know, is it you think it'd be possible to get down to the refugee camps and 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 whatever?" And the only email I got back, the only response I got back was, "We, you know, we stand by every word of that statement. It is not safe here. Do not come." So I went. And, um, <laughs> but like, um, you know, it was, but it was, it was, it was very, I have to say that was the most intense period of my life. Yeah. And it was, it was exactly as dangerous as, as it sounded. It was exactly as, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, nervous and stressful as it sounds, you know, get, get into to Bangladesh. And I was just told right away, you know, we'll send a car for you, the charity that I was going down there with to help. Like we'll send a, a car from you from the hotel, mm -hmm. you know, make sure it's only that. And they, they told me like, and I had, um, family, you know, family sort of acquaintance friends over there that, you know, through connections and they, they sort of, you know, met me early on and they just said like, Hey, you know, never get into a car with someone who you don't trust with your life because you are trusting them with your life. Well, yeah, literally. And, yeah and um not just because and, of the person behind the wheel driving the vehicle i mean like mm, um, and, and and then some so yeah yeah and 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 that too though the driving there is nuts like it's absolutely crazy they don't have lanes on their freeway it's like an eight lane freeway there are no Free lanes all. it is a, absolutely it's like mad max it's, a, it's like a traffic jam in, in you know the world of mad max and um and, and basically and like, driving in New York City. I mean, they've got lines painted on the road, but they don't really mean anything. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These ones, like every car was just smashed up. And the buses had these had these big steel siding on them. And they were all just dented in and crashed and scraped. And it was just like, oh my God. And um, it actually looked like these buses actually looked like the like like it's, a bus you'd see in Mad Max with like armor plating on the side and everything. And, and it was all smashed in, but, um, so, you know, they sent a car for me from the hotel. They're like, you know, make sure that, you know, you don't get in anything with anyone else. And so, you know, that, that's a bit nervous at first, but, uh, you know, did that. And, um, as we're driving out of the, ho of the airport, you just see like the streets, like around the airport are just lined, you know, with you know, dudes with machine guns. And I was just like, okay, that's, that's a bit. Yeah, that's so this a bit, be that uh, kind of party. Okay, real? this is uh, yeah game changing. And, and so I was thinking, I was just like, all right, well, you know, it's an airport, you know, it's a high profile target. Like, fair enough, you know, you need military presence there, uh, you know, when you're dealing with this sort of thing. Like, okay, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give that that that's that's normal. We got out of the airport. The streets were lined with people with <laughs> machine guns, you know, guard. Well, basically guarding guarding the buildings, you sure. know, against against these these attacks and ISIS attacks, and you know, got to. Uh, the the hotel that I was going to stay in because I had to stay in Dhaka, which is like the main city in Bangladesh. 
I had to stay there for two days before I could get a, a, a shuttle flight down to Southern Bangladesh where the refugee camps were because there, there were only limited number of flights, only every few days it would go down. And so um, pull up to this, this hotel and there's just five dudes with like, you know, machine guns and everything like that, just looking, you know, pissed off. And so I was just trying to think, I was like, okay, these guys you know, presumably work for the hotel. That, that means that they're, you know, there to protect me, but this is, you know, it's a bit of an intimidating mm-hmm. sort of scene. And so I'm just, I'm just sort of being calm about it. I'm just looking up and I'm just getting my bags out. I'm just looking up and I'm like, just trying to piece them out. And they sort of looked at me and they sort of saw the look on my face and they're, and they're all looking all mean, like, and all of a sudden they saw that look and I, no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Come on, yeah. come on. I'm like, okay. All right. Yeah, these no, guys are there. We're to your protect security me. force. Yeah, we got yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, it was actually good from that standpoint, you know, um, you, know before, you know, until that point there were attacks and there were a lot of, a lot of attacks. And as soon as that was hyped, you know, stamped up, uh, those targets were not attacked anymore yeah. because, you know, people, people attack soft targets. And, and they're, so they're looking for the easy way and make a damage. So that's it. Yeah. And so those areas were much safer, yeah. but you know, they were like, you know, they have, they, they stopped every car a hundred feet away from, from the hotel. They, you know, check them for bombs. for bombs. Yep. Yeah, mirror under the bus, under the car, and everything. And then you get up, and you have to go through metal detectors. And there's, you know, it was, it was pretty intimidating. There's some dude with a sawed-off shotgun just glaring at you as you're walking through the metal detector, and uh, and you're just like, oh god, please don't go off. You know? It's kind of funny <laughs> but, you're talking about that. Like I don't watch a ton of television, but I I just queued up. I'm a big like Green Beret fan, you know, uh, seals, like all that world. Like I love. If what audiobooks I'm listening to right now, I just listening to all the tactical education, the life lessons, the transformations learned from serving in the most extreme environments, which again, mm-hmm. you basically were. You were serving the general public that were being taken advantage of in a war-torn region, mm-hmm. except you weren't the dude with the weapons. You were there to oh. heal people. So yeah. it's uh I mean, was there a decompression period after that? Like a little psychological decompression coaching or you have to go see somebody? I mean, it sounds pretty traumatic. It was, yeah, it was very intense. Um, And, uh, but no, I didn't, I didn't like, you know, seek counseling or anything like that. I was, I was okay. Um, It was, I was happy to leave (laughs) and and get, and get home. But, you know, it was, uh, I, you know, I was there because, you know, I was, I, I was there for a purpose. And, and so, you know, I just kept focus on that and, you know, I don't, I don't go into situations that I, that I haven't thought about. And, no. and I remember thinking that, well, you know, I might die, but you know, I'm one person. Mm-hmm. And if I don't go, there are going to be a lot of people that won't thousands. get help otherwise. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, just like, well, I think that I can't justify not going you know, if I had, you know, a wife and kids and, and everything like that, like, obviously that's not, that's not possible to do that because it's not my life that I'm, you know, risking there. It's, 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 it's their father and their livelihood and their, um, you know, they're, they're involved as well. So, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have done that in that situation. It was hard enough doing that, you know, leaving my siblings and my parents and my nieces and nephews. Unfortunately, my, my niece was, who I'm very close with, I uh, was, very upset by that. She actually did have to get counseling just because she was so worried about me. Wow. And, um, you know, but, uh, yeah. It's but interesting like- you bring that up. Like I, I cannot connect at that level of exposure, right. What you went through and stuff. But as you're explaining this, I had to look it up on my site quick because I've been following him online right now too. There's a guy, he's a former special operations, like guru. He's been like, everywhere through the seals training everything former green beret he published a book um his name is ryan hendrickson and his book is called tip of the spear and i'm just thinking of him because literally he's already retired this guy literally had his leg blown off by a Mm. landmine and he was the first person at his severe level of foot dangling off the leg like it was a hot disgusting mess apparently the photos are amazing uh that he was one of the first guys years ago to go through this reconstructive surgery like they said They've never reconstructed a leg and a foot that was that bad. Mm. And he's like, I have to return to serve. And they through like 10 experimental surgeries, rebuilt his leg. I mean, it was a hot, disgusting uh-huh. mess for a while. Uh, but, and then he went back to serve and wow. it's an amazing backstory, but now he's now out. Um, but he's over 
in the war zone right now trying to do he's teaching the people over in um you know from the russians and everything else he's he's over there his instagram posts are him showing people how to find landmines and, and trying to get landmines out of the farm fields so the people can return to farming like uh, this past week like a, a poor guy lost his life because he was trying to run a combine to you know get the fields going again and that ran over a landmine and blew the combine over like just this, this massive machine so anyway it's mm-hmm. just Again, people have a choice. Um, I, I even put that in my book uh, when I, I served as a hotshot wildland firefighter. And we've, at times, depending on how bad the years are in Australia, they ship us down to you uh, because we were the best of the best. And I remember my friends and family saying, why are you leaving your corporate career to go do that job? And this is you know over a decade ago. And I said that in the book. I was like, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't like, I don't like the cubicle life. And that seems more worth my time. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, besides the adventure, and again, I never planned on writing a book about it, but now it's like it, until you go through that experience and you put yourself in those severe situations, it teaches you a whole different level of appreciation. And you, you probably had such a massive component of growth from that uh, after you came back. I mean, that next year or two must've been, I don't know, eye opening and powerful for you. Yeah, it. I mean, yes. It, you know, you, you know, I, I sort of had my my eyes open before I went there. You know, mm-hmm. so it wasn't like I, I went there. I'm like, oh, I had no idea, something like that. I, I had a very good idea, and yeah. I was, and um, and um, you know, so it was. Uh, you know, I, I expected it to be really bad. Yeah. And I I figured there was like a 50 50 chance I wasn't coming back. Yeah. And um, and so, but I felt that it was worth it to do that. And you know, it was. I mean, you know, I, I I never fooled myself about about the realities of the third world, but you know, seeing it in person and 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 you know, seeing people like just live like that, it's just like it obviously makes it you know very very real. You mm-hmm. know, and understanding things and and seeing them for yourself are two very very different things. And so, yeah, it definitely gives you you know a, a broader understanding of, of humanity and the world in general. Um, and, uh, and so I, I, you know, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I'm very grateful. I, I got home as well, <laughs> but, um, you know, I was asked to end up, you know, run the, the field hospital that they were building there and then, you know, run some of the, the clinics and the, and the hospital sort of in that, in that camp. Sure. And, you know, which I hadn't intended to do, I intended to just go there and help out as much as I could while this was going on. Well, and you're one uh, of the crazy few experts who rolled in and was willing to actually spend some time there. So it sounds, the, it sounds like they might have been a hair shorthanded uh of yeah crazy, well that's, crazy that's it like you. <laughs> yeah well that's it because they i mean they just they just did not have enough people to help out and so you know when this first hit you know there was a thousand people crossing the border every hour and there were already nearly a million people and and it was it was just crazy how many people were there and you know a, apart from people having you know over 40 percent burns all over their body and you know gunshot missing wounds or, you know yeah. yeah gunshot wounds gashes i mean you know things that that just that just no one really would ever want to hear about yeah. you know and and evidence of i mean no there's i don't know i, I read all about that i remember there's uh, abuse uh, rape uh and mm-hmm. then you just have people who might not have gone through all those severe parts but mal- malnourishment right there was a whole nutritional issue there was you know low income i mean there was I mean, so even if you didn't have a gunshot wound, you were abused or got blown up, these people rolling in are also malnourished. You know, yeah, you got to mm-hmm. basically rebuild these people from the ground up. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, you got a million people, you know, that's a population of a, of a good going city, you know, so, wow. you know, you have all these acute issues from, you know, the, you know, the, the situation that, that they were in and you've just got people that get sick, you know, and have problems on top of that. But, you know, there wow. were, there were, I don't even know if I should tell this, but. I don't know. It's, it might be too graphic for people. Um, All right, fuel fans, yeah. if you don't want to listen to it, pause and skip 30 seconds to 60 seconds ahead. Keep going, yeah. Doc. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> it's an open format show. We keep it real. I've had some very interesting conversations yeah. on this show. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, I mean, you know, you, when you see people and, and you hear these stories and they're telling you about what, what they experienced over there, and then you see the actual scars that line up with their story, you know, it, it becomes very real. Yeah. Um, so there's one lady who 
so th so there there's a there's a thing over in, in Bangladesh. So they're the Rohingya. That's the name of the people there that that were were subjugated and and um, slaughtered yeah. and escaped. And they're um, um uh you know they're they're just you know uh, so they you know back in like you know the 1950s when when Burma you know stopped being a colony, uh, they basically just said you know the the majority just said right, all you different factions, you're not part of this country, get out. And they're all like, we've been here forever. So obviously that's not going to happen. They're like, well, you don't get citizenship. You don't have any rights. You can't go to school. You can't get jobs. You're illegal. You're legal aliens. And, uh, and that's it. And so they're like, well, that's not going to happen. Um, we're going to fight for our rights. And they got shut down. They like murdered like all of the, of the fighting age males and were killing a lot of other people as well. And, you know, a bunch of people fled into Bangladesh in like 19, late 1950s. And they were there for a while. And then they negotiated a return. Uh, Bangladesh did. And they came back. And then sort of like the young boys, uh, you know, who saw this became young men. And they were like, well, this is bullshit. And they started, you know, it up again and, and, and saying like, well, we want our rights. We want our citizenship. We want you to stop raping our moms and our sisters and uh, and abusing all of us and uh, and then there was another uh shutdown and they again you know killed all the men killed all the fighting age boys and then they did this so so when i went over there this was actually the fifth time that this had happened in, in, you their, know? History. So like, in their history yeah 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 and, and exactly the same damn things you get this critical mass of young men uh who are just tired of this shit and just like yeah all right let's do something about it so the the sort of the you know crimes against humanity were, were pretty severe and and, and and one reason this wasn't really getting the publicity that it, that it may have before was that the the leader of now called Myanmar um she won the Nobel Peace Prize dude and <laughs> for the, for like being like her work in you know, humanitarian uh um, missions and um, and for being the first democratically elected uh, leader of of uh, Burma, Myanmar. But what what people don't realize is that her father was the first military dictator of uh, Burma in the first place, and he's the one who started all these things. So she she was raised in that household. Interesting and bloodline. Was, yeah. yeah, and so she she was um, you know it's, all, it's always been military control, right? So she yeah. she's like democratically elected, but at the same time, you know, she's obviously been in with the military from birth, and so maybe that was the first person that they would allow to be democratically sure. elected. Yeah. Um, and they they've since taken it back over again, but um, you know, but so you know, the, it was a bit of a, a bit of a shell game anyway. But um, like there was. The, the thing there is that like the women apparently from what I was told culturally um, try to stay pregnant as, as often as possible. Oh, um, to keep the repopulation of the male, the fighting age, like you were talking about to try and keep, I don't know, the fighting forces alive, so to speak. I, you know, someone coming from, you know, an area that, that doesn't have, have these sorts of realities would, would think that, yeah. um, no, it was, it was to slow down the amount of times they would get raped by the military oh, because God, that's apparently, even worse. Yeah. apparently they thought that there, there was, the thought was that they, they didn't really like, um, they found it distasteful to rape a visibly pregnant woman. I would hope that they would. I would hope that they would find so it distasteful to to pregnant. do that to anyone. Um, mm -hmm. But so they they basically stayed pregnant as as often as possible because they they would be less likely to be raped when they were that amount of trauma. pregnant. Wow. Yeah. So there was there was one lady that I met and uh, saw the scars to prove it that um, she was being detained by uh the the burmese military and she was being raped, raped gang raped for like the whole day and oh, and she was just begging them you know because she had a very young baby um so she was begging them please let me go please let me go i need to feed my baby i have to feed my baby you know she's she's hungry i have to feed her please let me go please let me go feed my baby and so eventually they did but 
they cut her nipples off. I was going to say, left. I already had an idea where you were going with this. That is, yeah. I mean, just awful. I mean, think I mean, of it, just the pure evil of that. You know, uh, like there's this mother in distress that you've already just destroyed her humanity. Psychologically, and, and physically, everything. Yeah. And then there's like all she can think about is is feeding her baby. That is that's all that's consuming her. And then you, you've physically taken away her ability to do that. And she might die of infection and, and blood loss. And and but either way, like she's not she will not ever be able to feed her baby again. Ugh. And, you know. Is your baby going to die? Yeah. Are they going to be able to find a wet nurse? But I mean, it's just what. Just, and that's why just I wanted you to share evil. that. Because again, I, I live in the United States of America. We have so much jade over our eyes. It's, we have a good life. A lot of us need to be reminded of, and how appreciative we are. Like my wife, actually, when I ran into you in Texas, the keto con, my wife was in Croatia and she got to meet a very nice gentleman that was helping with a tour there around with some of her old veterinary school friends. This is a very small tour group, but obviously Croatia is right near the old Bosnian war and all that turmoil area. And the gentleman, I forget the exact line, but he's just like, yeah, I don't understand how he's like you Americans. He's like, he wasn't doing it in a derogatory way, but he goes, you guys got too much time to worry about everything. He goes mm. here. He's like, he, he, even him himself, he's like, He's worried about how to pay rent. Like he, what he gets paid is barely enough to pay the rent for the roof over him and his family's head. And they still have to then now acquire food, nutrition, right? Everything else. And then he's just like, what yeah. we see in the online, the social media world, he's like, he's like, he's like, all I'm telling you this for is like, appreciate what you have. Things are not that bad. Right. So yeah. When, people, when, when there's people over here and are in, in a better state of life or when we're like, oh man, I can't do this and I can't do that. Well, do you have a roof over your head? Do you have enough money to buy food, proper nutrition? You know, yeah. all that. There was a, you know, during that time that I was, I was going over there, like sort of, you know, mid, mid to late uh, 2017, this is when all the, like the microaggressions uh, things were going on about talking about, you know, and, and, and for those who, who, uh, you know, are blissfully unaware or, or don't remember the, the microaggressions thing, the definition of a microaggression, you know, by the people making, making the, the term up was that this is something that was not traditionally felt to be offensive by, you know, by the norms, um, was not intended to be offensive, but someone just found it offensive for whatever reason. And that's your fault somehow. You know, she, you, it wasn't something that's normally offensive. It's not something you meant to be offensive, but someone was offended by this and that, and that's, and that's somehow your fault. Mm. And so, and, and because it was in a, you know, termed it aggression because you're in, in, in their mind, you're able to meet aggression with aggression. And so this is why this is where, you know, punching a Nazi came from. Well, that triggered me. So I get to punch you in the face. You know, like, no, you don't actually, you know? And yeah. so I remember when that ha- when when I got the call from the the, um, the charity I asking me that to help out because I had I had a friend that worked for this international charity called Direct Relief and they were like hey look we just we need doctors to help help out over here like I know you're I was crazy enough to off. make the trip you know yeah, yeah. All that. and and I was I was taking some time off from my my residency um, to help out my, my parents with you know, family uh, health issues and so I was a bit of a free agent so they were like they were like hey can you can you come help we need people that can stay there for you know more than a week five days and so I was like, well, I, I, I think I've always been of the opinion. You, you get a call like that, like you sort of ha- are obligated to say yes. Like you have to, to do that if you're Find a way possible. to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like hearing about this and being told like uh, what's going on there. I'm like, how do I not know about this? What the hell is going on? I've been living under a rock. Like what? And the problem was it, it really wasn't being publicized um, at the time. It, it came later. You know, that came later, but at the, at the very beginning, like you didn't see it anywhere. And so I was just, I was just scouring like all the news channels, all the cable news, all the network news, everything. I was just literally just flipping between news stations to see who's covering this, what the hell is going on, how this should be over everything. Right. And this should be the only thing we're talking about nowhere and yeah. just saw it nowhere. And I remember seeing, um, I remember when, you know, flicked on to like CNN and there was this, this old, you know, just prune faced bent who was like talking about, 
you know, um, microaggressions. And she was saying, because these are microaggressions, you know, an aggression is the same as, you know, and a microaggression is the same as an assault. And assault is the same thing as murder, that the amount of microaggressions going on in America, this was the largest genocide in human history because of the well, microaggressions. Well, there's a genocide actually going on there's in an the other part of the world. There's an actual genocide going on. I mean, it's just like, you know, oh I mean, it, it, just, it, just, it just pissed me off. And I remember... Um, being in Bangladesh and speaking to uh, the, he was, he was a military commander in the Bangladesh um, military. And now he was since retired and he was, he was running the charity and the operations on the ground. He was obviously, you know, when you're military, you know how to organize and, sure. and, uh, and uh, um, you know, coordinate a lot of people and, and, and uh, you know, buildings and this is and that. And so, you know, a natural progression is going in and, and managing other things. Very nice guy, very, very nice, kind guy, um, you know, happy, smiling all the time. And we were at one time we were having having lunch in the, um, in the right outside the refugee camp and uh, like in this little straw hut sort of place. And and we were talking about and the, 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 the fact of microaggressions came up and I was explaining to this guy who lived in these conditions and was in the military in these in this part of the world what the hell a microaggression was. And he was just he being must have used. And like, oh, he, was, he was just like, what? What? Yeah. Like, what? He, could, he probably couldn't like, even fathom you know, it. He's couldn't even fathom no. it. Yeah. Well, he was just like, oh, that's crazy. Because like, that's the thing. Like you're saying, you know, like when you, when your life is real, you know, those things just don't hit the radar. So like, you know, when you're, when your life is consumed with macro aggressions, yeah. microaggressions just don't make the bar. And so he was it's like a mosquito like, oh, hitting your windshield, like moving on. Yeah. yeah like, yeah. You know, it's just like, what, what is the big deal? Like, Oh my God, there's a bug. You know, yeah. that's the same as hitting a deer. Like yeah. it's not actually, it's really not. Now I got to go you kill know? all the mosquitoes. You'll know the difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, so yeah. And um, it, it, was, it was sort of nice in that way too, just being in a place that, that just had a bit more sense of reality. Yeah. You know, unfortunately they had to, but you know, but that that always you know struck me um, as as the sign of a, of a blessed civilization. You know, community. If you have time to worry about microaggressions, you live a blessed life. Mm -hmm. You know, and things are really really good for you. You, you know, do and a that's whole podcast show on microaggressions. <laughs> That'd yeah. be hilarious because there's yeah. so much of that. You're right. It's it's kind of rampant right now, and it's like I think. Mm. Oh man, what's an old slogan? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Like so many people, <laughs> right? Like, dude, just, just could you check yourself at the door? Like, what are you? What are we doing? What are In we the doing? words of the bard, right? <laughs> and, 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 I mean, or not not to completely flip the subject because I just love where we're going with this, but it's like mm. let's tie this back to your my mm. favorite subject, which is you know eventually meat. Want to talk about that on the show? But it's like uh, the the microaggressiveness of the anti-meat movement is always mm. hilarious when i'm watching sean baker's feed doctor uh, again ladies and gentlemen you might remember him he's been on the show a long time ago i gotta get him back on after KetoCon as well it's been a been a hot minute your feeds as well if anything i'm actually now renewed to enjoy instagram again even more just by watching the hilarity of these microaggressions but i mean the problem is though and whether it's PETA or whatever, veganism, vegetarian, yada, yada, yada. I don't care. You you live, you do you, right? But it's like the level of aggression that has stemmed out of it, to your point from innocent little microaggressions, it's just nuts. Like, where are we? Mm. I, don't, I mean, it sounds like it's even worse down in your neck of the woods than it's even here. I mean, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I mean, there haven't been like the, the assaults, you know, like that, you know, people, you know, just attacking you physically, but yeah, no, they, they, you get a lot of people um, that very are, very, yeah, and, and very much in, in, involved in like a, na a nanny state sort of situation. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe you look at like, you know, like East Berlin, you know, and that, that's a dramatic comparison, but you know, just there, there are similarities, um, you know, in East Berlin, three out of five people were informants for the government, you know, everyone was a narc. You know, and they weren't narking out like actual crimes. They were they were narking out, you know, thought their own, their own crimes. Yeah. You know, and that you're just like, no, you didn't do what you're supposed to. I, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna tell on you. There's a lot of that here. I mean, there's a lot of just you oh, know, we saw that with the whole pandemic. Like just, 
I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah, and you, you and, guys were like in Wackoville. I'm like, what is going on down there? I'm yeah. Like, Everybody's <laughs> telling on everybody. And there's, I was like, Dude, yeah. What is yeah. Well, that, well, and the thing is, though, is that they would they would actually make things up too, because they were, at first sure. that you could you could come in from another country and whatever you just had to isolate at home for two weeks, and that was it. You know, and that, then they put it in like hotels, like you had to pay five grand to stay at a hotel, and then people figured out that actually that's illegal. You don't have to pay for your own incarceration. You know, it's like yeah, I'm going to arrest you, and you have to pay for it. And 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 some people just stopped. It's like yeah, I'm not paying. I'm not doing that shit. You don't have you know you know that's that you can't do that. And all of a sudden oh, they on, realize that. Wait, wait a minute. You're going to arrest me or incarcerate me yeah. or whatever, and then you're going to bill yeah. me for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that was the thing. You know, people had to pay for their own their own uh, um, you know uh, imprisonment in these in these uh, hotels. And uh, I pay should be for able to get food every day. If I'm paying for my own yeah. incarceration, I want a nice ribeye. Yeah, yeah. To a perfect rare with butter every day. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and like, and um, so, so people just started going like, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm not paying for that." And it, it actually, it actually slowed down and stopped like shortly after that. And they're like, "Okay, well, we're not, we're not paying for this." And so they started going back to like, um, like literally, maybe like a month later, they went back to like uh, home isolation, yeah. except for certain certain things. And, um, but, you know, at first when, when people were able to home isolate, they, they just had this thing. They were like, you know, the police would check at your house. We don't have many, as many people doing it. So they were able to do that. And, uh, maybe they just do a random check every now and then if you weren't there, that was big trouble. And you could get fined up to $50,000 if you, if you broke isolation, you know, they, they really go for big air. And here's the kicker. If someone narks on you and that results in you getting fined big money they could get part of that they get like 20 percent of that a sales so, commission yeah like, exactly thank you for your referral so, here's your referral e fee exactly and so if you if you uh got busted for 50 grand you know your narc would get 10 percent like would get ten thousand yeah. dollars and so yeah, exactly. So that they would get so, up to ten grand. A, that is East Berlin, like obviously yeah, new exactly age, new age ver version of the old World War era. Uh, yeah. Wow. Dude. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully and we so, don't get there with meat. I mean, that, that, <laughs> I mean, I'd rather, yeah. I'm okay with that if you're telling people, telling on people that are eating too many plants. How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, uh, but I, you know, I knew people that were getting narked on. They had the cops showing up to their house. You know you know, a couple times while they were in isolation, Jesus. knocking on the door, there's a bunch of cops there. I'm like, Oh, and it's, it's very confronting. And, uh, and it's supposed to be. And they're like, it was like, yeah, we heard you were outside your house. You know, where have you been? What have you been doing? I was like, I, I've been in, in here. My I, yard. I was like, well, we I'm have a course that you were outside your house. Why were you outside your house? You're not supposed to go. I was like, I was not outside of my house. I have not left my house, you know? And so, you know, they're trying to sort of intimidate them into like admitting this or whatever. And they're like, look, no, I actually wasn't outside of my house. And so, you know, but that, that you know, so their neighbors were just saying like, I, I bet you, I bet you they've come out at some point or maybe they can't prove that they're not. I want that money. And they, they, they didn't, didn't even give a shit about this person about that's that money's coming from them. That's screwing their life over yeah. and giving them a criminal record. Uh, but oh, But I might get something for it. Because here's the other thing. Nobody was thinking big picture. Eventually, a pandemic blows through, right? Or whatever we wanted to call this, right? So what's that neighborhood like now? Because if you know that so-and-so was the narc and they made money off of everybody else's tr trials and tribulations and turmoil, mm. like you are not a respected neighbor. Like I can't, yeah. you, you better be moving to a new neighborhood. I don't know. Yeah. Um, is any of that happening? Well, well, yeah, you know, the thing is, though, is that it's all anonymous, you know, so they're, they're all protected. Yeah, you so you got these, the, yeah, the, these, you know, Karens that they're just like, you know, just doing everything, you know, living their, their Karen like ways the assholes, and, uh, assholes. yeah. And then, you know, it doesn't come back to them, but you know, you, you get people like, you know, if you're like jaywalking or like, you know, if like, you're like, you know, like, you know, sitting at a, at a red light and you just check, check your phone, yeah. like you, you'll get some of these people like, you know, like honking at you, like, get off your phone get off your phone and like filming like, i'm filming you i'm filming i was like okay so you're on your phone too bitch yeah, you know yeah. like you know, get say, off yeah, your, your phone's phone. in your hand doing something yeah I just exactly look, i'm on a red light i look down quick just to double check my gps yeah. or whatever um, yeah exactly wow. you know so yeah that, there's there's a lot of that you know oh and God. so it's just like it's a bit of a, a weird mentality and so you know it was you know it was sort of a bit of a nanny state already and you had these people that were you know doing that 
living that nanny state life where they were, you know, just, just narking on people. See, yeah. and this is, I mean, again, I love talking about health, business, and lifestyle, right? So we literally just hit on the business of ratting on your neighbors to try and make a mm-hmm. little money off of being fine. And then you got the the Karen on Karen steroids. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, dude, is it just, is that just where Australia is right now? I mean, mm. it sounds like a, that sounds like a pandemic of people just having too much time mm. on their hands back to these microaggressions and everything else. Like, dude, people go back to work. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, you guys got to get busy. I don't have time for any of that. And like, well, you're, I, talking about, you're talking about the news earlier. Like, I stopped losing respect for the news, like after God, the era of like people like Walter Cronkite and all those like legit people who like traveled to war zones and reported like, and they didn't care what the network said or what the government said. They just they shared the truth and yeah. And they also shared positive stories once in a while, just not all the negative crap. So I I learned a long time ago in my entrepreneurial groups that I'm in, when I started becoming more successful, I was like, guys, you're not just a product or some of the five people we spend the most time with, but also you choose what to surround yourself with. And that comes down to your media content, the television, all that stuff. And you want to change your life's direction, change that. Like that's just a lot of negative influence and negative energy and Dude, the past few years has been hard enough. I mean, mm-hmm. what the hell? People need to get a life. Yeah. Well, <laughs> nice. that's the thing. I think I think it's it's a bit of a power trip, you know. You know, it's just, it's just people, you know, because these are the rules, and you get to you. It allows them to like tell you off and make them feel important, like yeah. they're the yeah. ones making the rules. Like they're the ones like, yeah, you better do this. You know, it's just like you know, like you're a wayward child or something like that. And so, you know, it's generally people that that want that sort of power trip for whatever reason and they and they're just you know exerting that power over people they normally would not have power and control over and uh, and they're just like you better do this you better fall in line this this is the rules these are the government and like um you know that, that was the thing you know that stalin said you know the you know that um you know communism you know wasn't about kindness communism was about controlling your fellow man and using this to uh, to do that and have power and control over them and using and that, propaganda you know, to do it. So, yeah. And so you're just like, well, this is the rule. like, you got to do this. And so they would use that to, to have power over people. And that was, and that was the point of communism, uh, uh you know, to Stalin. And it was and very then, successful in different, different generations, not yeah. just Stalin. Right. But I mean, mm. lots of dictators and inappropriate rulers since they use fear, yeah. fear mongering and all that type of negative propaganda to get what they want. And yeah, yeah. And then, and then, you know, they empower, you know, people to, you know, have these power trips and, you know, it was like, you better do this and all that sort of stuff. And, well, it transcends you know, into sales and marketing. Like they've already proven it, right? Like they were able to pull off a world war one, world war two. You got things like Vietnam communism has been around a long time. They could pull off some big, big inappropriate adventures. And a lot of it is led by negative propaganda, really consistent education, even if the education is wrong, but you said you're playing on people's nerves, fears, all of that stuff. It's very polarizing. That same energy, that same tactile success, which eventually gets squashed and beat out. We do beat it down, uh, but it's applied into modern day nutrition, health, your medical mm-hmm. practice world. Our mutual uh, obsession with healthy nutrition in, in regards to carnivore lifestyles, right? It's like, but then you've got all, you're now we're fighting all of this negative propaganda coming from bullshit documentary films and inappropriate commercials and the fake meat industry saying claiming that they have a less of a of a footprint and all this crap. But I'm like, and then you got like you said the Karens, which actually my one buddy's married to one. Uh, she, <laughs> uh, she doesn't listen to the show, and even if she did, good. Uh, but it's like, dude, I don't care if you're driving a Tesla eating your, 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 your sugar bomb fruit, like fruit on fruit, on fruit, on fruit, on vegetable smoothie stale. It's like, dude, one, mm-hmm. you're going to die of diabetes Two, uh, you're going to break the grid because we're not ready for hundred percent electric cars across this entire country or the world. Don't get me go. Right. But I was like, now, now you're going to, uh, put beef in a negative category and, and quick for you and, and newer listeners. Like I grew up on a farm, so I've been around this my whole life. I grew up raising animals, knowing their impacts. I grew up around what is good farming practices, not good bad farming practices. And I literally, I just posted on Facebook this past week. I went and visited the, the, the farmstead that I sourced my beef from. And they're very, they're, they're a seventh generation. 
like 200 years of this land. They have over 150 acres and they 100% rotate the herds through different species of grasses. Like they've literally grown mm. different styles of grasses on different sections of the pastures because they figured out the perfect balance of different grasses. So proving mm. that you could do grass fed, proving that you could do sustainable farming, like all this stuff, they, they don't have to crack the earth if they don't want to crack the earth, the old plowing, all this stuff. But nobody wants to see that. Like I could post that up and get like barely any clicks or views other than my fellow carnivores would be like, hell yeah. I want to, I want to work with your farm, Scott, (laughs) you know, stuff like that. But like, you're dealing with that down there too. Baker brings it up. You bring it up. Uh, Vinny Tortorich, you know, Mr. Anderson G himself, like all these great speakers from the KetoCon events. Like how do we pull people's heads out of their asses is my (laughs) question to you. That's I don't, I don't follow a script like that. Just bring my head. I'm like, how, how do we do it doc? (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, I think it, I think it comes from, you know, word of mouth, people, you know, actually living the life and, and having these benefits and having these visible, tangible results and, uh, and just being an example, you know, when I first got here, um, you know, it was, there was a very big vegan movement. There still is a very big vegan movement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and so, but everyone was really convinced of that, that just vegan was the way to go. And so I come in here and I'm like the only human being in Perth and, and probably most of Australia who, who, who advocates for this sort of thing, but certainly where I was from and people I was meeting, they were just like, what? it just like blew their minds. And, and, and so way, I would have the newer listeners. Like if you look up Anthony Ch- Chafee online, like he's a bit of a, rugby playing dr god like physically (laughs) so it's like that's the other thing you look at the average vegan they're withering away and then you see (laughs) you or like dr baker who's another brick shit house right it's like okay are you really trying to say that your lifestyle choices are better at the biological level than what we're doing when we're we actually have muscular structure on our bodies and you you guys are also (laughs) practicing doctors so it's like you're, you're literally comparing yourself to a doctor who's mm. built like a brick shit house and <laughs> saying that our ways are wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, yeah. Well, you know, it, um, I, I, I ended up getting into these conversations like two, three times a day, having to give my whole spiel on, you know, why we're carnivores and why this matters and like, you know, and the nutritional, uh, uh, you know, um, thoughts behind it, you know, plants having defense chemicals, not wanting you to eat them, you know, being toxic, you know, to ingest and, um, you know, just all these different things. So it was, it was good in a way because I, you know, I I really honed my arguments Mm -hmm. because I was, you know, I was using them so often. Um, but I was, I was, you know, uh, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I was in, I was in good shape. Um, and, um, and I was a doctor. And so that, that carried weight with some people, other people just pissed off and they were just like, yeah, you're a guy. I can't believe you're a, you're an actual doctor. Well, that, actually, like, that's a good point, right? How, how hmm. do you, do you get in trouble? Because I mean, obviously we know from, I mean, from Vinny's fat, a documentary, the first one, a fat documentary two. lots of doctors in there. Uh, what's his name from down, uh, outside of New Zealand, um, he, oh, he, Gary Fetke. Yeah, Fetke. His license yeah. was pulled. And mm. uh, what's his name over in South Africa? Like all these doctors got attacked because, because, okay, yeah. because you didn't study dietetics or nutrition, a doctor's mm. not allowed to talk about nutrition. Yeah. I still don't understand but, that. I mean, I yeah, get well, it, but I was like, what? You're going to pull my license? Yeah. But you know, the, the thing is though, is that we all studied biochemistry and right. biochemistry is the science of nutrition, you know, the actual science of nutrition, whereas a lot of these, these, these studies, so-called studies that we find in, in nutrition are just, you know, nutritional epidemiology, right. you know, it's just like you get a survey and it's just like, well, how many times have you had corn chips? How many times a week do you eat corn chips? And how everybody's supposed to memorize times? all that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, how, how are you, are you averaging that for like, how long? It's like in the last year, how many times have you eaten, you know, barbecue ribs? Like, yeah. F would I know and, that? And, and let's pause on that real quick. Let's clarify from your perspective as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of, and I'll be guilty of this. Go, ladies and gentlemen, way back, you know, way, way back, I was one of those idiots. My dad called me out, which now it's funny because now my dad's type two diabetic and I have to tell him how to do things better. And he goes, well, you do remember that time where you said we should be eating all egg whites. And I was like, yeah, dad, I was wrong. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it takes a bigger person to admit that I was still reading dumbass magazines with unfounded research and epidemiology, which back then I also thought, oh, that's a fancy word 
that's probably legit studies. And then never <laughs> took the time to go in and look into what that actually means. And it's all fluff data. Uh, how you, how do yeah. you explain that to people? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the thing they don't, they don't realize just how poor these things are. And, and, yeah. um, you know, that, that's one thing that, um, you know, Nina Teicholz points out in, in her you know, great writings and book. Yeah, no, yeah, she is. Fat and surprise. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, points out that like these studies, you know, they're saying that like, well, people who eat five or more servings of meat a week, they're at higher risk of all these other th sorts of things. First of all, there's correlation does not equal causation. You cannot prove causation from correlation. And so, you know, there's a slight increase in correlation, but because there's so many confounding factors and these things aren't very good that you really don't pay attention to them unless you get over 200% you know, increased probability or correlation between these things. Um, so things like, you know, you know, eating meat and bowel cancer had like an 18% increase in co correlation in this one study, but subsequent studies have found no correlation, but either way, it's under, it's under 200%. So you, it's really background noise. And one of the things that makes all this background noise is the fact of how they define things. First of all, you never, I mean, how do you know exactly what you've eaten for the last year? Like you don't, it's, and it's not, they're not designed in a way that you can actually do, you know, Even facilitate an accurate journey. answer. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you know, you're not going to be able to answer these things accurately. And then even if you were able to answer them accurately, they define things weird. So, you know, if you eat pizza, because pizza can sometimes contain meat, that's considered meat. So someone who says, yeah, I eat, I eat pizza once a week. I was like, oh, okay. So this person who eats meat, you know, once a week or whatever, it's like, well, no, actually, I mean, meat is the least part of a pizza. Yeah. So even if you got a meat lover's pizza, you still got a giant slab of dough, a giant, yeah. giant uh, sauce fest, and then cheese. Yeah. I was like, no, meat yeah. is not the primary ingredient. <laughs> well, but, but also you could be getting vegetarian pizzas because it doesn't matter what kind of pizza you have. They sometimes pizza has meat, therefore pizza is meat. This is these are this is the the rationale of these people. They're not smart people, no. you know. And so you know, that's not that's not a. If you're being honest, that's not that's not a a intelligent way to design a study. And I don't necessarily think they are being honest. I think a lot of these play these these people have have agendas. And well, we so all, again, as a marketing guy. It's all about the headline, right? I mean, mm. nobody, everybody wants everything right now. Snap, 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 done, move on. So they're going to skim ahead. They're going to look at either the primary header, secondary header. So they're going to put something that's polarizing that could be, that could fuel the fire behind some kind of bullshit propaganda. And then the average consumer is not going to dig into it. They saw the word study. They didn't look and see, well, was it a double blind study, right? Was there a control yeah. group, right? No, it was all that, probably epidemiology. Was it a good study. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and that's the thing, you know, but people think that's like, oh, there was a study that showed that. Study, Therefore, it's true. It's like, you can, yeah, well, but you can have a study that concludes anything, you know, on any side of the argument. And, you know, and I, I'm well, well aware of that. There are going to be studies that support what I have to say that may not be very good studies. So I have to be careful about that. I have to look at things and say, okay, you know, what is the evidence for this? You know, how did they do this? You know, there was that, that uh, carnivore study out of uh, Harvard, you know, there's like 2,029 people who are self-reported carnivores. Um, they said, I've been a carnivore for this long. I'm, I'm, this is, I only eat actual meat. I don't eat these other things. Or maybe I'll have some coffee. Maybe I'll have some, some dairy. Maybe I'll have whatever. Yeah. And, but a true 100% they... carnivore does not consume dairy or coffee, right? Is If you're going from the purebred, so to speak, right? Uh, a true 100% carnivore would not do those things, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, generally, maybe maybe dairy is like a, con a condiment. Sometimes you can yeah. get some cheese on something or use butter. But yeah, I, you know, I I don't eat, I don't like drink milk. Uh, right. Maybe very rarely, you know, have some raw milk or something like that. I know, aren't we but, the only mammal after the age of four that's still consuming like quote milk? Again, ladies and gentlemen, that's mm -hmm. not I'm not we're not we're not talking about butter or or cheese. We're talking about milk, like consuming yeah. milk. Yeah, I don't I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm you know, just that, you know, yeah. Well, you know, it has enough uh, lactose as well that it will raise your insulin. And, and, you know, when you raise your insulin, you know, hyperinsulinemia causes a lot of biochemical changes in your body. Yeah. And, uh, and then there, there are changes that you don't necessarily want. It derails your metabolism. It slows your metabolism. It puts you into a fat storage metabolism as opposed to a fat burning metabolism. And, you know, there are actual studies with actual science that show that people just on a, just on a ketogenic 
diet or, or in, in, in ketosis, your, their basal metabolic rate is on average, you know, 300 kilocalories higher than someone else who, who's eating carbohydrates. So, you know, if they have the same caloric intake on paper, they're actually having very different results. You know, sure. so one's losing weight, the other's gaining weight. And it's the simple dynamic of the, of the biochemistry and people say, no, no, it's just calories in calories out. Maybe in, in a sense, if you really get down to the fine detail, you know, we're bringing energy in that's reacting in a certain way and we're, we're expending others. And maybe the, the difference is stored as energy. And maybe the you know, a difference is, you know, you, you, you're taking away a net loss of energy, but it is way more complicated than that. Because mm -hmm. first of all, you know, your the a calorie is not a calorie is not a calorie. You know, these things don't just act as calories in our body. These are complex organic molecules that have chemical reactions in your body and yeah. they will be different than the other ones. And so it's not just like, you know, just a gram of, of carbohydrates, that's four calories. That's the only thing that it does. No, it, it changes things fundamentally in how your body processes energy. Yeah. Even so, if we just pause on the note of, of hormonal influences, right? Like uh, Vinny mm -hmm. does a great job talking about the whole leptin and ghrelin, right? The hunk, AKA the, yeah. the hunger hormones, right? Okay. So back yeah. to your point. On every calorie unit of energy equally is going to trigger those obviously sugars and grains. Absolutely. But if I eat a nice ribeye, those calories are not affecting those hormones. Like a sugar bomb smoothie does. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, and that's the thing, your insulin just derails your, your, your metabolism, right? And you know, as we said, because, because blood sugar is actually harmful, high, high blood sugar is actually harmful because yes. You know, the, the glucose molecules will physically fuse to other molecules called glycation and or glycosylation. And so it's, it's physically fusing to these other molecules, changing the molecules, making them so they don't work properly. And so, you know, this, this is what kills diabetics. This is this, this inside out degradation of their body is this chronically high, um, uh, blood sugar that's just, just damaging them. And so in a defensive mechanism, your body increases insulin because it, you know, it sees your blood sugar go up and goes, sweet Jesus, what has this idiot done? And it's like, a, you know, damage control. It's just like, just get the insulin out yeah. there. Just get this stuff because you're trying to stamp down your blood sugar as quickly as possible. Yeah. But, you know, insulin has a long half-life. And so, you know, it goes up high it's, and then it up. stays up. Yeah. It takes like 24 hours for this to come back down to normal levels. Generally, that's what's taught in biochemistry. That's what I was taught in biochemistry. Again, back, back to your yeah. point, every doctor should have at least gone through the basics of biochemistry. Should have known that. Yeah, it's a prerequisite for medical school in America. It's not in other countries. Other countries, you don't even necessarily have to have a college degree. It's you know, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's an undergraduate uh, uh, entrance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a six-year program out of high school. But um, you know, and they touch on biochemistry, but not not you know, they don't go into great detail. You know, but but in America, like you're required to take a year of 400 level bio biochemistry. That's a requirement, you know, and you're, you have to take a year of inorganic chemistry and a year of organic chemistry. You Is know, that you why most doctors say that they never got to really the, the college curriculum to be a, a standard MD, for example, most mm. doctors, even Fecky and other guys all said this, like, yeah, the average doctor has not received enough education on nutrition and diet dietetics, but to be fair, that be fair, that's a specific course curriculum that's after the biochem component that you're talking about. So technically, yeah. to your point, everybody has learned the basics of understanding how things metabolize in the body, function, trigger, yeah. everything, thanks to biochem. Yeah, and, and 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 exactly. And if you think about things properly, you you will understand. Like, I mean, that that that's really you know how how what that so is biochemistry. Think, why that, do you think the average doctor says they don't know anything about nutrition then? Because they just uh, because they don't think about it in, the, in that context. Mm -hmm. They don't look at it. You know, they don't realize they actually know more than they do. But, but, but the thing is, is I, you know, it's actually easier for me to talk to doctors about this, even, even the ones that are just way on the other side of this, because I can explain to them biochemically what's happening. And they go like, no kidding. Like that is what's happening. So that's like, I, hack. you get, you get to them from the biochem world. And then yeah. now, now all of a sudden they're connecting again because they do remember yeah. that course load. Interesting. Yeah. Well, my my um, my mom when she she went on carnivore, you know, after like two months, she was a type two diabetic for you know nearly thirty years and not a very well controlled one, you yeah. know. And so her HbA one C, which is a marker of your, of your blood sugar control over three months, is uh, was you know uh, eight point nine, which is quite high. Yeah. You know, you don't want it above six in two months, right? So this is a three month marker, but after two months, her HbA1c went down to 6.1, which is, wow. which is 
just over the upper limit of normal. And, and, and she was, and the, the most important, um, interesting thing was that she was actively coming off her medications as well because her blood sugar was too low if she was on her medications yeah. uh, for diabetes. That, that happened years ago to my dad. My dad became too type two diabetic. He wasn't always right because he doesn't live the farm lifestyle anymore. And I'm always telling my pops, I'm like, dad, I'm just doing the way you raised me. So all you got to do is do go back to the way we were when we were kids and you still had the farm. He's, he's at least down to one medication, but I remember we started getting him healthy. He was at least paying attention to what I do. And then all of a sudden he was blaming me because he was all out of it. And I'm like, dad, did you go, did you, did you call your doctor? And he goes, what do you mean? I'm like, well, if you do start doing healthier practices, the drug is a bandaid. I call it the pharmaceutical bandaid. I love saying that. Cause I'm like, the drug is because we're, we're treating the root cause now. So if we start reversing your unhealthy practices, you got to stay in touch with your doctor. You might have to change your formulation of the drugs or yada, yada, yada. And sure enough, they end up, to, hey, he was on two drugs. They knocked him down to one drug and then eventually lowered the dose of that drug. So I was like, you see, it's working, you know? Yeah, um, yeah exactly. Well, and, and you know, that that's exactly what happened with my mom as well. And so, you know, she came in and she was, I was like, how are you feeling? I was like, I feel horrible. I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, what's your blood sugar? You know, and she's like, oh, I, I don't know. I was like, well, you're on medication to lower your blood sugar. You're not bringing in exogenous carbohydrates. Your body's actually making the amount that it actually wants. Mm -hmm. You know, so you might be too low. She checked it. Sure enough, she was too low. And she's like, oh, okay. All right, that makes sense. And so she started adjusting her medications. Um, went in to see her doctor after two months, got her HbA1c back. And it was, it was a tr this dramatic difference. And her doctor was just, was, was really interested. In it. And th thankfully she's, is a good doctor yeah. and an intelligent woman and who can, you know, when, you know, a lot of doctors, they say like, oh, you know, they see the results and then they just go, no, 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 it's definitely bad for you. Definitely stop eating meat. And she just looked at this and just went, how the hell did you do this? Yeah. What the hell did you do? You know, type two diabetes is a progressive disease. It only gets worse. You know, we can mitigate it and slow it down with diet, lifestyle, and medications, but it only gets worse. It does not reverse. It does not go backwards. How the hell well, did you do she this? That's well, that, but that's yeah. it. Because that is what that is what we think. That's what the ADA a, a, leads you to believe here, American yeah. Diabetes Association. Yeah. Yeah. And so you know, and so how the hell did you do this? And so she, you know, told her about, you know you know, my research and, you know, I thought it was like biologically we are carnivores and we're eating these things that derails us in, in various different ways. And like, you know, he's been doing that. I've been doing a lot of research on this and, you know, she said, you know, I'd, I'd really like to take a look at his research. That's, that's really interesting. And so, you know, I had, I, I hadn't written anything up at the time. It was just things that I was, I was, I was studying on my own and, and coming to different conclusions. And so I just went in and spoke with her and um, it was like my mom's, you know, it was supposed to be like a 20 minute consultation with my mom, I ended up sitting there with her and her, you know, PA physician's assistant and just sat there for like an hour and a half, like talking about this. And their, brain, like, their brains are yeah, like blown wide open. <laughs> literally on the edge of their seat, like leaning forward, like, you know, damn. Yeah, and, keep going. Uh, yeah. And like, you know, and, and she's, she's a very bright woman, you know, she's an MD PhD from Harvard. She has a PhD in biochemistry from wow. Harvard. And like, I was telling her, I'm like, you were looking at biochemistry all wrong. You know, we're calling this a fed state and this a fast. Have you state. followed up with her? Is she is she doing more of her own personal commitment committed research into this now to expand on yeah. this? I haven't I haven't looked into that in particularly. My mom like still that. sees her and she's Just still saying. and she's still um you know arguing this and, and she's she's incorporated this into her treatment of diabetics as well so i'm sure she has i mean you know, I, I sent her a ton of, of studies and articles that i i would just that hope that if across. she's that smart of a woman and, and yeah. a professional i would hope that she, this would trigger her to continue sure her would. own i, I well, guess you want to call it n1 self-education just like i yeah. treat myself as an n1 carnivore i'm like all right here's how i do it i'll just prove it i'll just live that way yeah let you know how it goes. So, yeah, well, no, I mean, she, I mean, she definitely did in, you know, right away because, you know, she asked, you know, if I could share, you know, some, some of these different studies and articles, things like that. And so I, you know, I did, and I'm sure she, you know, looked into it more than that, but, you know, I was saying, I was just like, you know, arguing to a PhD in biochemistry <laughs> that we're, we're looking at biochemistry all wrong. This is a, they're saying this is a fed state. That's a fasting state. I'm like, I think that's wrong. I think the so-called fasting state is our primary metabolic state. That's not tricking your body into thinking, starving to death. That's not putting yourself in a starvation mode. That is how we are supposed to live. That is how our biochemistry is supposed to work. That's where all of our heavy machinery comes to bear. Yeah. We have studies 
um, you know, looking at the biochemistry of animals in the wild, they're all in that so-called fasting state. And, um, you know, they don't, you know, and, and they're producing the glycogen and the, and the blood glucose and the ketones, and everything that they need to run perfectly at all times. And, and it works better that way, you know, just jumping back to the changes that, that carbohydrates make via insulin, you raise your blood sugar, your insulin correspondingly goes up as well to try to protect you, I think. Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, insulin, you know, forces energy into cells. It doesn't allow it to come out of cells. It blocks lipolysis, it blocks uh, proteolysis. And so now you cannot mobilize your energy, energy reserves. You have to run on the carbohydrates. And so you have to keep feeding yourself more carbohydrates because now you're feeling like crap. Um, and, but Which it does is why it's crucial to get your body to learn how to become fat adapted, right? To learn that from fasting or from a mm. ketogenic way or from a carnivore way of life. Yeah. Like I, I did a hundred mile mountain biking race last year. It was the, so that's my first ultra mountain biking race with 10,000 feet of climbing. So it was the hardest mountain bike race of my life. I yeah. did a, I, I trained following, you know, Vinny's methodology, shout out to Vinny Tortorich. And I was like, all right. I was like, I was already doing the Edison G thing. And I was like, I, this past year and a half, I went, I doubled down on my carnivore ways. And it was a lot easier to your point to reach the fasted state. It wasn't as, and like, you know, I've been eating, I don't eat, I don't eat three meals a day. I only eat twice a day. You know, it's like, oh, okay. And then if I got the right fats and protein profiles in my lifestyle, and like, next thing you know, I'm doing a race completely fat adapted, no sugary supplements, no carb mm-hmm. loading, none of that crap. And I was on a bike seat for over 13 hours <laughs> in the Jeez. mountains in 95 degree sweat heat. And I completed, I, now granted the pros, they, they did it in like six and a half hours because that's what they do. I, they do these races all the time. I was just happy to complete the damn thing. And I was like, all right, I proved that I could do an ultra race fat adapted. That was a big yeah. thing for me. So I was like, yeah. holy crap. So, well, well, I, I mean, I always, you know, as, as a, as a, uh, you know, professional athlete, like, you know, I, I played, you know, you know, professional rugby for 10 years before medical school, five of those years, I was carnivore. You know, I was not eating anything else. That was, those were the, the best, most explosive and, and dominant dynamic athletic years of my entire life, you know? And, um, you know, I could not get tired. I couldn't run out of energy. I couldn't get sore. I just, I just could go, 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 go. And the harder I pushed myself, the more my body gave me. And, and not only that, but like, you know, I was able to push myself harder, but I also got more out of it. My body recovered and rebuilt stronger than it would have otherwise. And so I just, you know, my, you know, my, uh, performance and my athleticism that, you know, just was on a logarithmic scale as opposed to a geometric one. That's something that I wish would have been in full effect back when I served that uh, couple of years as a wildman firefighter, because we were doing 16 hour shifts. (laughs) You know, it was very militaristic. You got a 25 pound chainsaw on your shoulder. You got 40 pounds, 50 pounds of crap on your back. And you're hiking in the mountains all day, every day. You work 16 hour shifts, two weeks straight before you earn your days off. So it's just yeah. accumulated exhaustion over and over again. And these fire camps, you know, they set these big chow lines and you could eat all you want. So yeah, I'm loading up on eggs and bacon and everything else. But back then this is, you know, this is 2010. I didn't under, I didn't know the carnivore way. So I was just, we were just being taught to eat everything because you're going to burn mm-hmm. it off. Right. Just so, so yeah, we were just stuffing our faces, jamming cliff bars in my, my cargo pants, your pockets and stuff to take out on the hike. And I was like, man, if I would have known back then, I would just like said, Hey man, cook a steak well done. So it doesn't you know get funky in my pocket. And I'll just jam the steak in my pocket <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, or just load it up on jerky, uh, whatever. But it was, it was, I wish I knew that back then because now it's like, I'll be 45 next month. I, uh, I volunteer and I help build mountain bike trails in my free, when I have a free moment, I still do it a little bit. I did a lot more years ago, but I show up and I'm just going and people are stopping yeah. and they're hitting their supplements. They got to go hydrate or whatever. I'm just like, I'm just cranking out. I'm running chainsaws. I'm digging in the dirt. And people are like, how do you, you just go like, you know, like, I'm like, everybody looks at me like I'm a crazy person. That's why I have fire in my logo. I'm like I, that lifestyle changed me back then mentally, but now physically I could just go all day, man. It's just, it's a whole different performance level. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I, I certainly noticed that as well now, you know, I mean, obviously when you're in your early twenties, you know, you, you can, you can feel better than you do at other points in your life. But now I'm in, you know, in, in my late thirties, when I came back to this and now I'm you know 42, yeah. I feel better than I did in my late twenties 
And when I was still playing professional rugby and working out all the time, my body works better. My body feels better. You know, in the off season, I would, I would put on weight. I would put on fat. I wouldn't be as, as toned during the season. I was, I was yoked, you know, I was absolutely <laughs> shredded because I, I, you know, I worked my ass off and, you know, you know, I, I, I ate probably 80% of my calories came from meat anyway, yeah. regardless of, of the point in my life. You know, I never, I never was a big, you know, carboholic or, or, or anything like that. And so, yeah. you know, like, you know, most, you know, some people talk about this, this hyper carnivore sort of thing where you eat more than 70% of your, of your nutrition is from, from meat. And I'm like, I was, I've never not been that. And so, you know, and, and it's just the difference from eating some, some plants and carbs sometimes to now just never eating them at all. I mean, it's, it's just night and day. It is yeah. such a big difference. And so, you know, I, I never get out of physical shape, you know, I mean, I, I look muscular and, and lean because I am, but that's nothing to do with my exercise regime. You know, I just started doing, um, sort of the X three bar sort of thing doing like a 30 day challenge. I was say, did, I, did that rub off on you from Sean? Cause he's been doing that. You know, I, 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 I yeah. saw it, I saw Sean doing it too, but you know, I, I originally saw this when I was, um, all, with all the lockdowns and they shut down the gyms yeah. and I had like this beautiful home gym all set up, had all the equipment that I wanted, exactly how, what I wanted and how I wanted it back in Seattle. And I left it at, you know, stored it at my, my uh, parents' house there when I moved to Australia. Yeah. And, and so then all of a sudden, like I'm here in Australia and I have no access to a gym. I have all this amazing equipment. I can't use it. And I'm just getting pissed off. And, you know, I, I didn't even have time to go to the gym. I was maybe going to the gym once or twice a month, maximum twice a month. Yeah. And, but I still looked, you know, very in shape and, um, because it's all from diet. And then, you know, I was looking at it originally then because I was like, I want something I can use in the house and like, and, and all the gym equipment was being bought out. You, you could not get this stuff for love or money. And when you did get it, it was like, you know, three, four times the price. And oh I was yeah. Like, okay, well, it, it was, that. I was, I was building up my gym during the pandemic here. I mean, you want to get a hold of rogue fitness equipment, like forget about it. It was the waiting. You yeah. had to put yourself on a waiting list, email blast just to do it. So I was like, geez, yeah. I was like that, that invent, what's it called again? The, uh, the bar, what, or, X3 bar. X3 bar with all the bands and stuff. Again, yeah. beauty and minimalism and simplicity. Uh, and yeah. Man, and he, uh, you ever hear Dr. Ben, uh, how do you see his last name? Bo Bochichio, Bocachio. He was yeah, recently on Benny's podcast, awesome. episode 1206, and he was recently on the Meat Mafia Guys podcast. That's a newer mm. carnivore podcast. Um, you've been on them. You've been on the Meat mm, Mafia, right? Yeah. 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 They just posted him too. But basically, this guy's like old school high level education, fitness, kinesiology, everything like going way back. And he's like, you only need to work out for like 15, 20 minutes. And he's like a couple, <laughs> a couple times a week. Like you don't have to crush the gym like all week long. So, yeah. uh, but you said you, you've done it for a month now. Uh, yeah. So, well, half a month at this point. So I'm, okay. I'm sort of a couple of weeks into it and, um, you know, but yeah, I looked at them because I, I just wanted something that I could use in my, in my house. I didn't end up getting it at the time, but that's when I, I sp it sparked my interest. And then I finally was just like, <sighs> all right, I'm just going to get it and try it out. And, you know, I, I subsequently had, you know, um, Dr. John Jaquish, who you know, invented the thing on my podcast to talk about it. I actually just released another one with him with him coming around a second time, but that's not why I started it. Like, it, it's not like, you know, he sponsored me and gave me one of these things so that, you know, I could. I'm queuing could, you up um, on Instagram. <laughs> Is that you? That's a heavy that's me, band, yeah. dude. What is the yeah, tensile oh, that, strength that, on that, that band? Him. Jesus, look at this. I don't even know if the internet is making it uh, play nice for you or not, but obviously it's in your own feed, so you can watch this whenever you want. But, dude, that's yeah, a heavy-duty like, band. Wow. It, it's, it's a beast, man. Yeah, that's, so that's like the, you know, the elite band. You, you have to get that on top of the normal one. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know exact tensile strength, but, but the idea is, is, is it's, you know, is it's, adjusting the you know the the resistance you know the variable resistance is changing w with your motion because you know when, when your muscles fully contracted it's it's much stronger than when it's you know not fully contracted just because of how the, the muscle fibers and the actin fibers are lined up and 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 and, and you know binding to each other so you're a lot stronger you know at the, at the peak of your contraction 
than otherwise. But obviously we have to, you know, if we're doing a bench, we have to be able to get this thing off our chest, which is when we're at our weakest point. So we have to do a weight that's appropriate for our weakest point. You know, you're only strong as your weakest link, right? But this allows you to challenge your, this allows the resistance to match your strength curve. And so, you know, when it's, when you know, you're just on your chest, there isn't nearly as much resistance, but as you go out, it, um, you know, it goes out to, I, I think something like the, like the big one, something like something crazy, like 700 some pounds or something like that. And so that's like just, um, tricep extensions. Yeah. You know, and you're, and for, um, for the listeners, I'm screen, I already screenshot his Instagram, but I'm also screen sharing off of his YouTube. Uh, he actually has all these videos posted for you guys. So you guys should go look at it like this. I'm just looking at day five. You'd post this back on August 4th. So, um, I always like to do a little bit of screen sharing during the show. And by the way, again, ladies and gentlemen, just look him up, Anthony Chavy. I'll have all the stuff linked on the website too. But dude, strong following on YouTube though. You're approaching oh, thanks, 50,000. Very nice. Um, but yeah, watch watch Anthony doing what he's talking about now. <laughs> yeah. Because visually, you look at how thick and heavy duty those bands are. And I'm like, that's some, that's some work. That's some yeah. work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's good though, because, um, you can, you, you actually can just get this stuff done in 10, 15 minutes. So like, yeah. you know, I, like I was saying, I was like, I normally wouldn't have time to go to the gym and things like that. So that's why I like this sort of stuff because I'm able to just sort of fit it in because it's 10, 15 minutes and, um, I get a workout in and I actually enjoy going to the gym. I enjoy like being there and I just like just working oh, yeah. out for, you know, hours on end. I just, I enjoy it, but I don't have the time to do that. And so either way, you know, people will look at me and they'd be like, Oh, you must work out all the time. And this, and it's like, I, I don't actually, you know, well, that and, goes back um, to the importance of the kitchen, right? That nutritional yeah. side of your lifestyle. Vinny's always said for years, like, Hey man, you can't I'll exercise a bad diet. Yeah. I believe you agree. Am I wrong? I mean, we're talking about yeah, well, how are you fueling the body? That's it. Because, you know, when I was, when I was, you know, playing high level sports during the season, I could be in very good shape. And, you know, I wasn't eating high octane crap. No, you know, I was eating mostly meat and then some other stuff as well. And, um, and, and I was in very good shape, but in the off season, just eating that same sort of normal stuff, I would put on, you know, excess fat, I would lose muscle condition and muscle mass. And, uh, and, you know, uh, and, you know, surprisingly quickly, you take a month off and you're just, you're a different person at the end of that month. Now it doesn't matter. Now I, you know, if I, if I'm not working out for a month, if I'm not doing anything for a month, I look exactly the same at the end of that month as I did before. And it may, it will take months and months and months for me to lose as much muscle mass. If I'm not eating enough, I'm not going to be maintaining it. You know, it's just going to, it's going to sort of shrink down a bit. Right. But I'm, my body fat percentage essentially stays the same yeah. and I don't, um, I'm not, uh, my body fat hasn't up. fluctuated in a long time now because same yeah. thing. I, I'm super lean. I mean, I did that whole DEXA scan while in Texas at KetoCon. I, I climbed in one of those vans. I always wanted to get a DEXA, uh, but it was like, great. They got them. They got mobile DEXA scans inside of vans parked in the middle of the trade show. So I was like, good, oh, I'll go do that. And it was cool because I hadn't done an analysis in years. And without even trying, I'm at 13%. Like I know I can, I've dropped below that, but the guy looked at the report and he goes, I really don't have much to talk to you about. He goes, well, your bone <laughs> density is a little light. I said, well, I'm in my endurance sports season. He's like, I was going to ask you. He's like, are you a runner? He's like, I see that often. I'm like, yeah, my strength training is backed off a little bit. I'm doing a lot more cycling right now. So that I already know my body. I'm like, okay, that would make sense. I'm not doing as much heavy weight training, triggering that strengthening of the bones, which again, ladies and gentlemen, that's why some strength training is better than no strength training. <laughs> Mm. Uh, but again, not out exercising a bad, you can't exercise bad diet, man. So how are you feeling no. it? So people think I have great genetics because I'm always lean. And I'm like, if you look at my family and I love my family, they're all overweight. Everybody says that my lifestyle is not possible. I was like, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. per my shirt, I sort of work hard. I don't really have to work hard. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an easy main maintenance. So people are like, hey, how do you, don't you get bored? I'm like, no eating amazing yeah. tasting meats like <laughs> yeah happy. first of all yeah I've, I've never i've never gotten tired of of, of eating meat I've, that's always the only thing i ever wanted to eat anyway and you know I, I certainly don't get tired 
of, of feeling amazing, right. you know, and that's, that's, that's what I'm eating for. You know, I'm not doing this, you know, I'm not trying to party on the weekends, you know, and that's, that's not why I eat. That's not my mentality. My mentality is to give my body fuel and to give it the best quality fuel that I can and to, and to be as healthy as I can and feel as good as I can. Yeah. I mean, you you're know? more, you're more dialed in. I don't want to say, I hate to use the word strict, but like you're not even drinking alcohol, right? Because I remember when you were, we went out to uh -huh. dinner uh, with your friends, I know you didn't have any drinks. So I know you are like uh -huh. hardcore. Like, Because again, technically alcohol is a toxin, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but I, I do plant. still drink. But it's yeah. I drink uh, either a scotch or a tequila with nothing else added. Mm -hmm. So again, if you quote Vinny, it's like, well, at least it's distilled. Yeah, you're getting all the impurities out of it, but it's still an alcohol. So it's still technically a toxin. But that doesn't mean you go drink a half a bottle. <laughs> like yeah. you want to, I was at I was at a uh, a wedding reunion the other night. I had one scotch. Everybody's like going through six packs and stuff. Of, I'm like, no, and <laughs> and and everybody's got the beer bellies, and I'm like, no, I'm good, fine. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm the same, and and you know, I mean, you think of it as strict, but you know, I just I just think of it in, in, in you from want a different direction. Yeah. Well, also, I just don't want to eat poison. Yeah, it's pretty simple. You know, like I want to eat food. I don't want to eat poison. And so that's what I do. I eat food and biologically food for humans is, is, uh, is meat, it's fatty meat. You know, food is, is species specific, you know, food to koala is different from food to a dolphin. And so, you know, what, what is food to a koala is not food to a dolphin. And so when you look at that in that context, food for humans, humans are carnivores. That is, that is a hard fact that is, that is a very well-established a fact. And as such, meat is what is food for humans and, and other things cause harm. Yeah. You know, that's why we shouldn't eat plants because they cause harm. It's not that, oh, you don't have to eat that salad if you don't want to. It's that you shouldn't eat that salad. That salad yeah. is bad for you. And so that's how I look at it. And I was like, I don't want to put in poison in my body. I don't want to put in, you know, toxic crap. And so, you know, some things are more toxic than others, but it's all a bit toxic and it's all less optimal. I, I definitely want to get, like, I get you back on if you're open to it. Cause obviously we've already gone way over our time slot as it is, but I want to do just a deep dive episode on just that history, right? The actual biomechanics, the biology, mm -hmm. everything else. But it's just like when I had Baker on a long time ago, I wanted Baker on just to get people to understand I'm like you are. Like now they got some backstory on you. They understand you got a crazy cool diverse background. But as people have been listening the past 20, 30 minutes, the second half of the show, Anthony can go deep. I mean, mm -hmm. some very, very hard hitting subjects here that I like to hit deep for on. Are you, are you, oh, are you open to that doing a second episode? Yeah. hundred um, yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah. No, because I, I, it's important yeah. we get into this content. Um, mm. I wanted today's episode to get to know you, but also I want my listeners until we can do a second show to just, you want the deep dive content, go listen to his show. So make sure you subscribe. Uh, Cause I already said at the beginning of the show, uh, the plant free MD because, and you're, are you now everywhere? Are you on Spotify and everything too? I know I yeah. have you on iTunes. I didn't get a chance to look on Spotify, but you probably are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, definitely on Spotify. Yeah. yeah basically any, any po uh, podcast platform yeah. um, that I'll be on there, the plant free MD. And then my, my YouTube channel obviously is. Yeah. The YouTube is uh, killing it. You know, Anthony so. Chafee MD. Yeah. 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 You're doing great on the, uh, and again, I, I'll have all the stuff linked in the show as ladies and gentlemen, but um, I wanted to just get more well-rounded content on you because again, when I hear you go on meat mafia or Jay, again, I listen to your show too. I'm a subscriber. Oh, you, you can get into some geeky depth with some of your guests, <laughs> your guests on your show. I was like, Oh, it's not a doctor. And I see, I love that. Not everybody likes that. I, I mean, yeah. I'm on a road trip. I'm traveling for business. I can sit there and just get my brain blown wide open. Listening to you guys just geek yeah. out. Um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, I was on this show, I'm a little more, we get more general and well-rounded, but then, then we deep dive a little bit later. So, uh, cause I, again, especially with oh God, these hot topics right now on meat and cancer and all this stuff, I was mm. like, dude, cause you had, um, who's that professor you had on your show? Uh, yeah. Pr professor Thomas Seafried from Boston yeah. college. Yeah. Dude. Great episode. Yeah. All right. Awesome guy. Yeah. I, I was, I was really happy to speak to him. Um, you know, really, really just, you know, you know, just shows, I mean, this is, this is cancer biology. This is, this is very well-established, you know, biochemical, molecular biology, uh, biological uh, you know, phenomena that we see in in cancers and in the human body, and this is how they behave. And these are the the 
the the you know the, the chemical pathways and and cascades that we see and this is why they happen and yep. all these sorts of things and so when you understand the cancer biology at that fundamental level you realize that we are looking at cancer all wrong and we are treating it all wrong and as a result uh, as a result of that the results that we get from treating cancer is suboptimal to put it as nicely as possible and and just completely you know, garbage to, to, to be probably more accurate because we're, we're trying to treat a problem that doesn't exist in the form that we think it does. And so, you know, it's just like anything with medicine. If you get the wrong diagnosis, you will obviously start the wrong treatment. And so you will get a bad result because the disease is going to be going on unchecked. Maybe there's partial efficacy, you know, um, you know, to it, but you know, you're not, you're not, the disease itself is not getting the right treatment. And you're also doing something that has a treatment that has other effects apart from the one that you want. And you're also getting effects that you don't want because you're treating right. something that isn't there. And so and even though the, those effects are, not, are, are doing something that you don't actually care about, you don't actually want. And then they're also having other effects that are, that are negative. And so you're actually sort of hurting yourself there. Well, it goes back to your, your multiple points already, which is like, again, what are the inflammatory triggers that you're allowing into your life? I mean, this is way beyond just like the topic of, topic of peppers and nightshades and blah, 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 back to plants, right? Well, removing that and so much more, like, I hate to bring him up again, but, you know, Vinny Tortorich beat cancer. They told him in five yeah. years, it was going to come back. Well, it's now like 10 years later and nobody's bringing him in to research how this guy beat a very large case of leukemia. Mm. And even his own top doctor who helped him basically said, Hey, Vinny, what's that thing you do to keep people healthy and fit for the movies? You know, you, you eat a lot of meat and you cut out all the sugars and grains. She's like, yeah, do that. Keep doing that yeah. while we're, while, you know, while we're pumping you full of poison. But mm. she's like, that's, she's like, we've got the science. It's still getting rolled mm -hmm. out, still getting published, but she's like, do that. And yeah. all these years later, he's still fine. Yeah. So, well, you know, you know, as um, as uh, Professor Seafried pointed out, and um, something that uh, Otto Warburg, who won the Nobel Prize in 1930 for his work on cancer, uh, showed back in the 1930s and 40s, you if you have healthy mitochondria, you cannot get cancer, cannot, okay, because this is a mitochondrial disease yeah. this is a metabolic disease. This is not a genetic disease. And so, you know, uh, he showed that actually, if you take the DNA with all these cancer changes from a cancer cell and put it into a normal cell with normal mitochondria, it doesn't behave as cancer. But if you take the mitochondria out of a cancer cell and put that into a normal cell with normal DNA, it does behave as cancer. And that's because the mitochondria and how they, you know, respirate mm -hmm. that dictates these downstream epi epiphenomenon like genetic changes and again, like the, the mitochondria are the literally the, they're the power plants of our cells at the That's cellular right. level. I've had multiple people on this show over the years. I mean, we've we've hit it from different angles. Obviously, the impacts of blue light or the impacts of unhealthy lifestyle beyond just nutrition, right? Or getting more natural sun exposure. Stop shellacking yourself in poison called uh, sunblock. Or I've even had a uh, Dr. Terry Walls. Uh, she was on. Now, granted, she was talking about everything she went through to recover herself and rebuild herself. Now, to be fair, she does eat a lot of plants still. Uh, but <laughs> the whole point here is like, what what are all these negative influences you're allowing in that are breaking down and weakening your mitochondria? Yeah, which are literally yeah. the power plants of your cells. Well, that, that was the thing. When I took cancer biology 22 years ago, this is when I stopped eating plants because I learned how toxic they were and how many carcinogens they were there were, and you know, uh, Brussels sprouts had 136 known human carcinogens, Jesus. you know, mushrooms had over a hundred, you know, spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, you name it. All these things had 60, 80, over a hundred known human carcinogens each. And, and they were quite abundant as well. The far outweighed the pesticides that we used on them industrially by a factor of 10,000. And wow. the naturally occurring ones uh, were far more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides we spray on them industrially. This is why we still have pesticides. They were trying to ban them in the 80s. Yep. And Professor Bruce Ames from Berkeley showed this in, this, in, in, his, in his work. And they were like, okay, well, I guess, you know, if you're going to eat the plant, like the, the pesticides are nothing. And so, you know, and I was talking about that with, with Professor Seafried. And he was just like, yeah, and you know, those, those plant toxins, they all attack the mitochondria, mm -hmm. you know? 
And so that again, goes back to the, 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 the biology of cancer and how that works. And it's about dysfunction and dysregulation of the respiration, the ability for, for uh, mitochondria to respirate and to, and to break down through oxidative phosphorylation, uh, you know, uh, glucose into ATP or, or whatever substrate into ATP. And so, um, there are, there are studies that have shown biochemically that when you're in a key, in a state of ketosis, you're not eating carbohydrates, you're, and, and for a prolonged period of time, you, your mitochondria work four times as better as well. They, they respirate four times as effectively, and they have four times the number of them. So this is very beneficial to your mitochondria. So it's, 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 it's actually very difficult to get into, uh, you know, a sort of a cancer state. Um, and damage your mitochondria enough when you are not eating carbohydrates. And, um, and also, you know, cancers, because they, they're not very good at this, they turn into a fermentive state as opposed to an oxidative state. Um, you know, they, you know, like aerobic versus anaerobic, you know, activity, you're, you're going to produce a lot more ATP with aerobic activity, right. With air. And so when you're going through, uh, fermentation, that's much less efficient. And so they have to draw in huge amounts of glucose. So, you know, uh, uh, Warburg showed in, you know, the 19, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, that, that cancer cells actually have to draw in 400 times the amount of glucose into them to just to run properly than other cells. So if you limit the amount of glucose that you're bringing in, if you go, if you just stop eating carbohydrates, your blood sugar is just going to be at a normal level, as opposed to being at these elevated levels. And you will reduce the amount of uh, energy substrate for these, these cancer cells to even work on in the first place. So you are starving them out and yep. now your body is actually working better. The mitochondria are healthier and your body can not only fight these things off better, but it actually is helping them sort of recover and, 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 and come back stronger for some of these damages as well. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 you know, I think that that was, um, that's probably one of the more important pieces of information uh, available to the world right now is, is his work and, uh, and the work of Otto Warburg before him, but you know, he's, he's really carried, carried the torch from Warburg. And so I, I think that, Man, that I want to help, like, help him carry his torch. I got to get him on the show. Absolutely. Now. Jeez. Jeez. Oh my God. Yeah. You know, he, like that, that stuff is, is so important. It's so important. And like, you know, I, I deal with people with cancer, you know, daily and it is a devastating illness. It is mm -hmm. just absolutely ruins lives, ruins families. And, you know, and, you know, when you, in my field, you were doing this in the brain. And so we're having to chop into people's brains and remove these things. And, you know, you can destroy someone's brain by doing that funny enough. Well, and so, so again, you know, when I, I've had my shoulder rebuilt twice by a surgeon, he's like, Scott, I can never rebuild you the way you were originally created. Right. Yeah. It's like, so imagine doing that at the brain level. It's like, we got to cut in no, there we, and, and we mess can around. only destroy it. Yeah. We can only destroy. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, you know, this, um, you know, what is the term? It's like, you know, like planned destruction or like, mm -hmm. um, whatever, but oh, control you know, chaos, control chaos. Yeah. And so, yeah. and, and so, yeah, I, I, I can't think of it, but yeah, control chaos is, is good. is good enough. And well, like, I, I, I didn't study the medicine, but I, I remember reading a lot of the health at health books. Like they talk about like you, open a person's body up. Like the protective mm -hmm. layer is your skin. You've, you've, no matter how good you are, even in a controlled environment, a surgical room, right. Mm -hmm. You, you have created some possible chaos mm -hmm. biologically, right. There could be all kinds yeah. of contaminants getting in there. Yeah. So, and, 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 you know, you're, you're, you're causing damage, mm -hmm. you know, but you're doing it in a way that hopefully will, will benefit the person more than, than it harms them. And, um, you know, like an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie was just, just, just <laughs> devastation everywhere, but like you get the end goal. Right. And, um, but it's, um, you know, with, with the brain, like, unfortunately we don't really have ways of fixing the brain. We have ways of removing offending, you know, uh, you know, offenders to the brain. So you have a bleed on the brain. We can remove a you know, large hematoma that's causing mm -hmm. pressure on the brain. We can relieve that pressure. You have a, you have a cancer that's inside the brain tissue. We can cut out that, uh, cancer. And unfortunately some of the brain tissue that it's in, and that will stop, that will remove the pressure from that cancer and, and, and hopefully slow this down because you're removing billions of cells, cancer cells. And so, you know, that, that is, uh, beneficial in, sure. in 
certain certain avenues, but we can't actually rebuild the brain. Like you know, uh, orthopedic surgeon can you know, like Dr. Baker can rebuild a shoulder. Sure, I can't rebuild a brain. No, you know, you can't. You can't. You know, only the body can do that at the moment. You know, you, we're, we we're not reattaching. You know, uh, um, different you know pathways and structures. Yeah, I was say you we literally are cut through cells. Their synaptic pathways are severed. I mean. That's it. Now, obviously, yeah. we've we've proven that with a healthy brain and healthy lifestyle choices, you can grow new synaptic pathways and mm -hmm. new connections. But again, is it going to restore that chunk that was taken out with the cancer? No, maybe, it's maybe not. Never <laughs> no. There you go. Yeah. But, you, but your brain, your brain's amazing. I mean, it, it yeah. can adapt to a lot of things, and so you can you can actually gain a lot of ability through the other parts yeah. of the brain. Will sort of pick up that activity. How the hell it knows that? I don't yeah. know. You know, you take out that part of the brain that says this is what I control. Other parts of the brain go, hey, hey, this is supposed to be happening. Who, yeah. Why isn't no one doing it? I don't know how the hell it figures that out, but it's amazing. It, it's, uh, it's just an amazing organ. Yeah. And that's why we got to get you back on the show because it's like not even cancer, but let's, I mean, just look at the, the inflammatory impacts of, I mean, let's just go back to keto, for example, right? A ketogenic fat adapted lifestyle, right? Uh, the Charlie foundation that was founded by the director of the old airplane movie, his son lived with massive, oh, yeah. uh, uh, oh God, seizures, uh, grandma yeah, seizures, like hundreds, yeah. hundreds a day. Now the kid's a functioning teacher, like helping yeah. children and, and his childhood, they considered him, and pardon the term, but, but back then they considered it a retardation, right? He was mentally impaired. He could mm -hmm. not function as a normal child until they started cleaning up the negative impacts on his life. So yeah, and, and put him on a ketogenic diet. Yeah. You know, that kid had brain surgery. He had uh, you yeah. know, a bunch of medications he was on, still getting seizures. And they wanted um, to cut I, into his brain again and take another chunk out. And that's what triggered him, his dad to say, yeah. wait a minute, yeah. hold on a second. Uh yeah. maybe I should not treat my son's brain like a science experiment. So, yeah. Um I, uh, I, I have to run because I have to make it to yes, the hospital, but I'll, I'll leave with, with one, one story that I just came across recently because, you know, in the, in the medical literature, you know, using a ketogenic diet to treat epilepsy has been, that that's been a well-established, uh, you know, tool for like over a hundred years, you know? And so, well, at least roughly a hundred years. So uh, over a hundred years for type two diet for, for diabetes, but about a hundred years for, for, uh, epilepsy. This is a well-established thing. And, and, you know, a lot of, you know, different institutions still use it. Like I, you know, I saw, you know, a paper from, from Johns Hopkins, uh, you know, a few years ago showing that it's just like, yeah, this is, this is still a really good treatment modality. This is, this is, this should be like first line, you know, but it's, it's, you know, it's helping people that are having, you know, epilepsy refractory to medications. So that should really be your first line. You should never put somebody on on a, on one of these medications without first yeah. trying that because it is first very, not very efficacious. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. And I, I swear to God. So I've made this point and I've spoken to people who have reversed their, you know, it's completely stopped their seizures and epilepsy by going on a carnivore diet and then drink, drink coffee, bam, have a seizure because these, these things can be neurotoxic to susceptible people. And so, you know, I, you know, I just, I just tell these people and, and just look, here's the studies, here are the facts, here are the, here's the evidence. And here are the people that are benefiting from this. And um, I, I was I was doing sort of a live Q and A session the other day on YouTube with some of my, my Patreon uh, members that I just started. And like um, one of the first questions was, "Hey, you know, my my son has epilepsy, and um, and uh, and and we were told that he shouldn't go on a ketogenic or carnivore diet because if he ever has a cheat day, you know, he'll be at risk of having a seizure." And it's like, what? Okay, so hold on a yeah. second. Wait, so. <laughs> we could stop them all together. Yeah. But that's too risky. Cause then you could get one bad one, one day. If yeah. Well, you if, you, if you stop doing it. So, you know, first easy answer, don't stop doing it. So we've cured, know? we gave him a possible, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it. Yeah. We're going to cure him for the mm -hmm. rest of his life by living this healthy lifestyle, not a diet, a lifestyle, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that's yeah. not fair to the child. Yeah. And, and it says, oh, but you know, if he, if he cheats, then, then he'll, he'll have a seizure. It's like, okay, so you're, 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 kid you're not recognizing. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. I was just like, I was like, well, that's, that's a bit weird. I don't think they're really thinking. I wanted to say a lot of profanity about this, but yeah. you know, I was just like, I was like, well, I don't think they're really thinking straight about this. You know, that's like saying, you know, stop your seizure medications because if you know, stop, you just don't take any seizure medications because if you take seizure medications and it suppresses seizures and you stop taking them, well, you might have a seizure. I was like, okay, well you just stopped. 
Well, then you know, I can, you're, I can you're argue saying that, uh, that it's you a bad stop thing taking to those stop. drugs because they have documented side effects. So we shouldn't take yeah. the drugs, right? Because right. the documented side effects. Yeah, well, but but that's the thing too. It's like you know, the effect is to stop seizures, right? And they're saying, oh, that's bad because if you ever stop in the future, you might get seizures. And it's like, okay, but you're stopping now, you know? Yeah. So you've just and you're, done right, and you're risking now one, maybe if he chooses to do that. And that's not even yeah. a guarantee. That's an if. Yeah. And so I was just like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know who that was. You know, hopefully that wasn't a doctor and this, that, and the other. And they just say, it was like, yeah, it was, it was their neurologist. I was like, the dear neurologist Lord, said this? what? Like you have got to be kidding. And I was like, get a new neurologist. That person needs that license taken. Get the hell away from that. It, oh Jesus. My God. And, and that's the thing. This is, this, this it, neurologists know about this. And I've spoken to neurologists. They said like, well, yeah, I know we don't, we don't use this because it's, if it's very been hard around for a hundred years. It has to have been in their hundred years. Hundred goddamn years. It has it to is, have been man. in the freaking curriculum. Well, it's, not, it's not necessarily in the curriculum, but it is in the literature. Right. But the thing is, the the curriculum is written by the drug companies, basically. Wow. You know, and you know that was the thing that, that Professor Seafried was saying. Because he actually did research when he was at Yale. He was an adjunct professor at Yale, did his postdoc, and then um, um, you know, adjunct professorship at Yale. Um, and uh, and his research was in a ketogenic diet and epilepsy, and basically. You know, all the people, all the, all the funders of his research and things like that, like now there, there's nothing in that. There's no money in that, you know, uh, in that sort of research. There's a quote. There's no money in that. There's that's the it. And it's yeah. all about money because, you yep. know, a key to just telling people to, to eat a certain way doesn't, doesn't, you know, sell a product, yep. you know, unless you have a, you know, a non keto, you know, a non carb based sort of product, which I, I, I Again, want. I'm want. a business professional. I've said this forever. It's like, guys, this, the, the medical world, the pharmaceutical world, everything is tied back to the nutritional world god forbid you cure yourself naturally now they mm. can't make money off of your unhealthy lifestyle choices well so, yeah well they can't sell you the poison they can't then subsequently sell you the cure right. and so you know whether that's intentional or not that is what's happening you know like we're we're, we're poisoning ourselves we're damaging our bodies sick and then people are worth a lot of money taking- yeah, we're taking medications to then mitigate those those problems. But yeah, so this was the neurologist saying this, and like that is in the literature. And this guy was recognizing that this is actually a, 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 a something that removes triggers for seizures. And he's saying, no, 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 that's don't what makes it even worse. Triggers for seizures. You literally admitted that it's going to work. Yeah, and that are saying don't do that. Yeah, 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 because it will work. And yeah. then, but if you stop it, it will stop working. And it's like Disgusting. right, okay, idiot. You, you just told them to stop doing it. Okay. I mean, like, I mean, you just, you do not want someone that's stupid. in charge I love of that health. you brought this story up at the end of the show, because this lives us a nice cliffhanger because we, when we do our next show, we can go deep into this silly horse shit uh, because <laughs> it, it's, it is awful. And it, I, cause I get fired up all the time. So uh, I like I like the the headliner because I want to respect you getting to the hospital too. By the way, I, I'm not trying to cut the show off, but again, we're way over our slot, ladies and gentlemen, because he gave you so much extra today. But he does have a professional responsibility to others, so uh, hang tight. I want to give you a proper goodbye off the air, ladies and gentlemen. He hinted at the Patreon. So again, all the stuff we linked in the show notes, but again, don't forget, he's got the YouTube here. I'm screen sharing for the video watchers. There's the Instagram again, Anthony JVMD. But don't forget, he's got, if you can search, you can just search anywhere on patreon.com with his name, but uh, I'll have the link, uh, patreon.com forward slash Anthony JVMD. He is building his own future community on here. So if you love supporting healthy influencers who give a true shit about what your actual health may end up being positive and not feeling the drug company world, you might want to pay attention to to Anthony a few more times than just this show. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get him back on a second time. Thanks for tuning in to another Live the Fuel show. We're here to fuel your health, your business, your lifestyle. Please go follow and check out more content from Anthony. And we will talk to you guys again soon. Have a great night. And remember, you too can live the fuel. Talk to you soon.